There are a number of issues which continually crop up for users. And in this video, I want to address the top five most common issues, starting with using VPNs with QBitTorrent. When you jump over to my wiki and you go to the QBitTorrent page, you'll see here in the deploy QBitTorrent section, I have three different tabs for three different ways to deploy QBitTorrent. The number one way we recommend is the Hodio plus VPN container. The Hodio container plus the VPN of AirVPN, which is the number one VPN to use with this, contains a kill switch. A kill switch is programmed into the Hodio container that in the event that your VPN goes down, your QBitTorrent will not start up. If your QubitTorrent is already started and your VPN goes down after it's already seeding or downloading, the container will continue to run. However, all traffic inbound and outbound will be completely stopped. This keeps you safe from leaking data that you don't want to be leaked. As I've just said, AirVPN is the number one VPN we recommend to use with Hodio. The reason is this is the most tried and tested VPN that has the least amount of problems. And the other reason is it continues to support port forwarding, which is gonna be necessary for private trackers. There is no other VPN that I know of at the time of this recording that allows port forwarding and works as simply and as directly as Air VPN. You'll notice on the Qubit Torrent tabs, we have other options for deploying. For example, NordVPN plus Qubit is here, and I will tell you, I did not write this section of the wiki. It's very hard to get this up and going because any other VPN provider besides AirVPN is more challenging due to complexity. That includes ProtonVPN. A number of users use Gluten plus Qubit, which is basically two apps in one Docker Compose stack. The first one being the Gluten container and the second one being QubitTorrent. Again, this is slightly complicated and requires a sharper learning curve. There is also an issue with this when it comes to port forwarding, and that's the fact that the port forward tends to change quite rapidly every few minutes, which breaks the connection to QBitTorrent. In this blue box, you'll see that many people have fixed this by using something called QSticky, but again, this is another container you have to run with more complexity built on top. The most simple way to do this is with the Hodio container because it already has the kill switch built in. And if you're using an Air VPN WireGuard config, you don't need to run any other containers to stay safe. All you need is this one container and your WireGuard VPN file, and you're good to go. Speaking of which, let's talk about what the WireGuard VPN file should look like. When you go to the Air VPN wiki page, there's instructions here to use the config generator to generate what the config file should look like. If we jump back to the Qubit Torrent page, on the right, I have an example WireGuard config in section two. This is what your WireGuard config should look like, but I'm gonna show you now side by side what a common WireGuard config that I see people generate is versus a correct one. Here is a side by side image of a correct VPN key and an incorrect VPN key. On the left is the correct one and on the right is the incorrect one. The difference is the incorrect one contains IPv6 information. Let's look at line two. On the correct WireGuard key, I just have a regular private IPv4 slash 32. And on the right, you'll see that same private IPv4 here, followed by all these letters and numbers. These octets are part of the IPv6 location and they need to be removed in order for this to work. The DNS line contains the same issue. Here, the DNS is 102801, and you'll see the same one on the incorrect side, but in addition, you'll see the IPv6 location, which needs to be removed. Finally, in the allowed IP section, you'll see here 0000 slash 0, which means everywhere. And on the right, you'll see the same everywhere, but you'll also see the equivalent address in IPv6, which is colon colon slash 0. All of this IPv6 has to be removed, leaving your file looking like this. This is a correct WireGuard file, and if it deviates from this by including the IPv6 information, Hodio's container will not work with it because his container does not work with IPv6. Now let's take a look at some common permission issues. I've created a new pool called Dozer. I've also created its sub data set under Dozer called Test. I have not adjusted any of the permissions on these to show you what it looks like when you create something and don't touch it. For my Dozer pool, you'll see my permissions are root root other, and that's fine. We don't have to touch the pool after it's created. We can leave it just like it is and it should be fine. The test data set, however, was created with the same permissions, root, root of, and this will not work for anything running apps or anything that apps need to access. The reason for that is on TrueNAS by default, all apps run as user group 568, which on TrueNAS is a custom user for the apps group and user. As such, one of these has to be apps, and for servers at home, we usually just change the group. 
In order to change that, we're going to go ahead and go to our permissions and edit, and then just change the group to apps. And then give the group read, write, and execute. This is a 777 permission. And then we remove other for safety purposes. Click the checkbox to apply group and click save. You'll now notice here root apps and other have been adjusted properly. Where some people get tripped up are sub data sets. So for example, if I go to my shell, and I'm logged in as root, when I navigate to my dozer pool, right now you can see my test data set. And now we can see it is root apps seven, seven, and zero, which is indicated by these three dashes. When I go into test, we can see it's empty. Let's make some directories. I've made three subdirectories under the test data set, movies, TV, and downloads. But look at their permissions. Their permissions are 755 root root, which are the same stock permissions that test was made with before I changed it. But I just changed the test permissions to be apps. What we need to do is learn how to apply permissions recursively. Let's go back to our data sets tab. Let's look at our test data set and let's edit the permissions. If I were to leave it just like this and I would click apply group again and click save and then go back to my shell. we see that the permissions have not been touched. What we need to do is apply these permissions recursively, which means apply them not just for the test data set, but apply them for every data set and every file within that data set to include anything that would be in any of these folders. Let's go back to data sets, click my test data set, click edit for my permissions. I'm gonna click the apply group checkbox again, and I wanna click this button down here under advanced for apply permissions recursively. A warning is going to pop up saying that this is going to make everything below it these permissions, which is what we want. So click the confirm checkbox and click continue. And then we also want to apply to child data sets and hit save. Now let's go back to the shell and see what changed. When we look at the contents of the test data set, we can see all the subdirectories are now different. We have a different set of permissions here. This is 770. And we can see it is now root apps. This is proper permissions for any apps running on TrueNAS. Consequently, all files within these three subdirectories will mirror this permission set, 770 root apps, because it was applied recursively. Next, let's talk about file structuring. File structuring is very important, especially to have common sense file structuring for two reasons. One, it makes sense to have all your data of a certain type collected in one place, especially for things like snapshots and replication backups. And two, it makes troubleshooting way easier if we already know where most of your things are. If you go ahead and do very novel naming schemes or you have your data all over the place, it's gonna make it an absolute nightmare to troubleshoot and to try and get everything organized for things like backups and snapshots. I've created a new pool here called new-pool. The first thing you're gonna see be a problem here is the fact that there's capitalization and there's a hyphen in my pool name. While capitalization is not a problem, Linux is very case sensitive. When I go to reference this pool, if I was to make a link to it and I were to put new dash pool, but I were not to capitalize the N and the P as it's shown here, it would be a completely different location and Linux would have no idea what I'm talking about because all the capitalization needs to be perfect. Otherwise, it's going to look in a completely different place that probably won't exist on your NAS. Let's look at some of the data sets I've made for new pool, starting with the media files. Again, I see capitalization here. This is going to be a problem when we go to refer to our volume mounts if we pass this into a Docker container, because if we fail to get this capitalization exactly right, it is not going to mount properly into a Docker container. We see in the media files data set, there are three sub data sets, downloads torrents, again, using capitalization and a special character, movies and shows and stuff. This is going to be a problem for a hard linking. A hard link is basically like a shortcut in Linux. It's very important if you're using a media management suite to make sure that your sub data sets are actually sub directories. There's a whole video on about this. I'll link in the video description. But if you jump over to the wiki to the folder structures page, you'll see a whole section here on hard links talking about why hard links are important and what needs to be done for hard linking to work properly in section one. This also covers the difference between a data set and a directory and covers some of the naming rules I've already covered like no spaces and no capital letters.
This is the ideal overview of what your pool should look like. You should have your pool name, a media data set, and then three subdirectories. You should also keep all of your configurations in one data set because when we go to snapshot and back everything up, we can just back up the configs data set and not have to worry about backing these up individually because we can set this to be recursive. Going back to my bad example, you can see here, I've got some configuration files all over the place. So for Plex, for example, I've got a configuration file stored here and my radar, which has ridiculous capitalization, has got some storage, which is probably also saving its configuration here. This is absolutely the wrong way to do it. All of the configuration needs to be in one spot under one data set, and my media needs to have subdirectories, not sub data sets. All of the capitalization should be lowercase, not because there's a problem with uppercase letters, but it's easier to remember if we're using all lowercase. In the event your pool is named something like this and you want to go ahead and rename it, there is a way to rename a pool without completely deleting it and losing all of your files. I have a separate video dedicated just on how to rename a pool, and I'm going to link it in the video description below. Lastly, I'll be covering a couple of Qubit Torrent quirks that some people get hung up on. When you first install Qubit Torrent, you may try to access the web UI and get something like this where it says unauthorized with a black page. Just know that this is actually correct. If you see unauthorized, this is working. Go ahead and click the URL and just hit enter and you should be greeted with the login screen. Enter your username and password and hit enter and you're brought into Qubit Torrent. Go ahead and click the gear icon and check the download section. By default, the default save path for QubitTorrent is slash app slash QubitTorrent slash download, which is incorrect. To use the proper folder structure as shown earlier in the wiki, the default save path should be slash media slash downloads. Once you've done that, scroll down and hit save. This has been a quick summary of all the issues that I've seen come up very commonly. If there's another issue that you see coming up commonly or a problem that you're having, please leave a comment below so I can address it in a future video. Thank you guys for watching. I hope this was helpful in getting you guys past maybe some bumps or some obstacles you've experienced on the way of getting TrueNAS and a bunch of Docker containers set up and running. If you like this video, make sure to give us a thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe to the channel so you get notified when new videos like this come out. Thank you guys for watching, and as always, stay curious.